in the name of God, ground, word, life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Glorify the Lord, you angels and all powers of the Lord. O heavens and all waters above the heavens, sun and moon and stars of the sky, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all. If you missed last week, uh, those opening verses are from the, the deuterocanonical addition to the book of Daniel called the Song of the Three Young Men. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's like, thanks for not letting me burn, right? Um, and we're, we're loosely following those lines through the season of creation that we join other Christians around the world in celebrating through the month of September, culminating in our patronal feast uh, on October 4th, the Feast of St. Francis. This morning, the verse we start with is part of the section called the Cosmic Order. So today, we're just going to dip just a baby toe into the whole idea of Christian cosmology, that is the origins of everything. And then after that, we're going to do something very old-fashioned. But before that, let's take a moment to reflect on yesterday, September 11th, the 20th anniversary of those terrible attacks in New York. Where were you that morning? What went through your mind as you heard the news or saw it happen? Why do you think it happened? And think on these past 20 years and the war that just ended badly for us, it was always bad for the Afghanis. What has changed for the better, for the worse? What has remained the same? Oh, the suffering, that the suffering of people of the earth caused by those attacks and our reaction. It's just tragic, the whole thing. And this is not unrelated to the subject at hand, the cosmic order of God. Uh, Leonardo Boff is a great Franciscan liberation theologian, and, and his book is called The Cry of the Earth, The Cry of the Poor, makes the convincing case that human poverty, that human suffering is an ecological problem. Well, listen for echoes of him in the second half of the sermon. But this is a key to opening a, a holistic theology of nature, a cosmic vision of creation and our part in it. We are not separate humanity. Our story is the world's story, end of story. There might be things of the spirit and things of the flesh, but all of it is of God. All of it is inextricably, ineradicably, indelibly connected to everything else. We humans are created and have our being through the very same divine forces as the trees whose skeleton you are sitting on this morning, as the mice that are surely running through the walls here, you know, as the bedrock on which the foundation of this church sits, and with every star, every, every streak of interstellar dust, every beam of radiation that travels through the vast expanse of space. As Sally McFaig, she's one of the more important early eco-theologians, wrote in 1993, Everything that exists, from the most distant galaxies to the tiniest fragment of life, has a common beginning and a common history. At some level, and in a remote or intimate way, everything is related to everything else. We are distant relatives to the scars, to stars, and kissing cousins with the oceans, plants, and other creatures on this earth. What does that mean? It means that Nothing is completely itself without everything else. Now, those are the words of, of Father Thomas Berry. He's a, a Catholic priest and anthropologist who is at the forefront, or was at the forefront, he died a couple years ago, of what is being called the, the new cosmology. The new cosmology is all about interrelatedness. Nothing is separate. And with his colleagues in the field of, of physics, you know, co cosmology, that he has worked to integrate scientific knowledge into how we make meaning of the world, how we understand God. Now, one of the ways that he did this, and I think the most interesting way he did, was exploring our creation narrative. He believed that our creation story in Genesis, 
um, which was actually picked it up by the, the Babylonian creation story called the Enuma Elish. So that means this is a very, very old story. In any case, Berry posits that the creation story that we have in scripture was told with the best understanding of the world at its time, discerned with the best technology that they had when it was written. We know a lot more now, a lot more about how things happen, you know, the Big Bang, fundamental laws of physics, the, the structure of the universe, and nearer and dearer to our own fleshy beating hearts, we know now about evolution. Through the revelations of modern science, we understand a lot better the how of the creation of Genesis 1 to 2, 3. Um, that's the in the beginning creation. So there's actually two completely separate creation stories. Adam and Eve is a completely different tradition. It's tacked on at the end. But I don't know. I don't know if the why given in Genesis is any less valid or true than it ever was. I mean, what does the story tell us? It shows the world arose from a creative act and it is good and God loves it. That is true. What a great way to understand existence. And technically speaking, they got the framework right. The basic premise of creation and evolution. It, it all starts with darkness, a void. God's breath alone goes across the face of the deep and then bang, let there be light. And there was and it was good. And then the chaos of existence began to become ordered and forms of matter differentiated. And then life evolved, you know, from plants to animals, to people, you know, from more and more complex organisms leading to us. And to put a Christian period on the end of the Genesis story, as Father Boff would say, it all led to Jesus Christ, which he called the pinnacle of human evolution. We are all related and not just through a common ancestry or, or shared history, but in our very substance as created beings. And this substance, how our common heritage, our common being expresses itself materially in things such as DNA, in, in the geological record, what we observe in outer space from billions of years ago, the light when it finally gets here, but, but also very much in how we relate to each other how humans get along and organize ourselves. That, how we do all of this, is all a product of the very same creative forces of nature that gave us this bush outside the window. I mean, think about rhizobial bacteria that live in the root systems of legumes, you know, peas and, and, peas and uh, beans, right? So the bacteria live in these little nodules on the roots, these little, little, little balls on there. Um, they get a home. That's what the bacteria get in this. The plant, makes space for them because the bacteria fixes nitro atmospheric nitrogen and makes it usable for the plant, right? It's brilliant. Think lichen, you know, the structure and ruggedness of fungi and the photosynthesis of algae. The nature of nature is revealed to us in relationships. And of course, the primary relationship that we understand that binds the universe is the most creative form of relationship and is the primary way we understand God to operate in the creation, what characterizes our relationship with God and God's relationship with us. And that is love. It's all love that holds it together. All we need is love. And the interdependent nature of the universe of everything is revealed in complex ways. The key, be, the key being that human interactions are no more or less important than non-human, even non-sentient interactions. And in fact, seeing our behavior, our human propensities to separate and subject each other to, see, to seamless aspects of the natural world can be extremely helpful to look at us as we would a naturalist looking at the natural world. And that was the point of my doctoral thesis you know, on the theology of sustainable agriculture. Observing and participating in natural systems give us an important understanding of our own nature and the nature of God in Christ and how we all get along. I'll give one example of how a complex human inter interaction is a great reflection of the nature of the world. Um, Joel Salatin, you ever heard that name? Yeah, okay, one, one Joe back knows him, okay. Um, besides Wendell Berry and probably Jimmy Carter, uh, probably the most famous farmer in our country. Um, he's written a bunch of books. 
you know, salad bar beef is one of his, uh, pastured poultry profits is another. You probably haven't read those. Um, but if you do know him, uh, you, you would know him from Michael Poulin's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. He was the, the third section, you know, the sustainable agriculture, like sustainable organics. Okay. He's got a farm in uh, Western Virginia called Polyface Farm. Very interesting. Um, but in any case, he had an observation about industrial agriculture that opens us for a view of our place in the industrial food system and our place in relation to each other, the world, and everything. I was at a conference years ago and, and someone asked him about um, CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, you know, the, the huge, think huge feedlots or like, a, you know, hog barns the size of Rhode Island, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's as unnatural and cruel a form of agriculture imaginable. It's awful and it provides lousy food on top of it. But he observed in, in, in critiquing this form of agriculture, a culture that does not respect the pigness of a pig will surely not respect the Tomness of Tom or the merriness of Mary. See the relationship there? We are all one, one love, one heart, one God, amen. amen. So here's the pivot. It doesn't happen very often, only once before in my ministry, but on occasion, a bishop will send a statement, a letter, an encyclical, a papal bull um, to be read from a pulpit on a Sunday morning. So our wonderful Bishop Brown did not send me a letter, said, read this from the pulpit, okay. But Pope Francis, the ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew, and our own Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, representing 1.75 billion Christians around the world, um, just released a statement called a joint message for the protection of the earth. Fitting, no? Um, and that has never happened before. Those three C's representing most Christians speaking in such a unified voice. It's a big deal and we should hear it. And it is on topic. So here it is in its entirety, a joint message for the protection of the earth. For more than a year, we have all experienced the devastating effects of a global pandemic. All of us, whether poor or wealthy, weak or strong. Some were more protected or vulnerable than others. But the rapidly spreading infection meant that we have depended on each other in our efforts to stay safe. We realize that in facing this worldwide calamity, no one is safe until everyone is safe. That our actions really do affect one another and that what we do today affects what happens tomorrow. These are not new lessons, but we've had to face them anew. May we not waste this moment. We must decide what kind of world we want to leave for future generations. God mandates, choose life so that you and your children might live, from Deuteronomy. We must choose life to live differently. We must choose life. September is celebrated by many Christians as a season of creation, an opportunity to pray and care for God's creation. As world leaders prepare to meet in November at Glasgow to deliberate on the future of our planet, we pray for them and consider what the choices we must all make. Accordingly, as leaders of our churches, we call on everyone, whatever their belief or worldview, to endeavor to listen for the cry of the earth and the people who are poor. There's Baf, right? Examining their behavior and pledging meaningful sacrifices for the sake of the earth, which God has given us. In our common Christian tradition, the scriptures and the saints provide illuminating perspectives for comprehending both the realities of the present and the promise of something larger than what we see in the moment. The concept of stewardship, of individual and collective responsibility for our God-given endowment presents a vital starting point for social, economic, and environmental sustainability. In the New Testament, we read of the rich and foolish man who stores great wealth of grain while forgetting about his finite end. It's in Luke 12. We learn of the prodigal son who takes his early inheritance only to squander it and end up, honey, and end up hungry, Luke 15. We are cautioned against adopting short-term and seemingly inexpensive options of building on sand instead of building on rock for our common home to withstand storms, Matthew 7. These stories invite us to adopt a broader outlook and recognize our place in the extended story of humanity. But we have taken the opposite direction. 
we have maximized our own interest at the expense of future generations. By concentrating on our wealth, we find that long-term assets, including the bounty of nature, are depleted for short-term advantage. Technology has unfolded new possibilities for progress, but also for accumulating unrestrained wealth. And many of us behave in ways which demonstrate little concern for other people or the limits of the planet. Nature is resilient, yet delicate. We are already witnessing the consequences of our refusal to protect and preserve it. Now in this moment, we have an opportunity to repent, to turn around and resolve, to head in the opposite direction. We must pursue generosity and fairness in all the ways that we live, work, and use money instead of selfish gain. The current climate crisis speaks volumes about who we are and how we view and treat God's creation. We stand before a harsh justice. Biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, and climate change are inevitable consequences of our actions since we have greedily consumed more of the Earth's resources than the planet can endure. But we also face a profound injustice. The people bearing most of the, the most catastrophic consequences of these abuses are the poorest on the planet and have been the least responsible for causing them. We serve a God of justice who delights in creation and creates every person in God's image, but also hears the cry of people who are poor. Accordingly, there is innate call, an innate call within us to respond with anguish when we see such devastating injustice. In devastating injustice. Today, we are paying the price. The extreme weather and natural disasters of recent months reveal afresh to us with great force and at great human cost that climate change is not only a future challenge, but is an immediate and urgent matter of survival. Widespread floods, fires, and droughts threaten entire continents. Sea levels rise. Uh, forces whole communities to relocate. Cyclones devastate entire regions, ruining lives and livelihoods. Water has become scarce and food supplies insecure, causing conflict and displacement for millions of people. We've already seen this in places where people rely on small scale agricultural holdings. Today, we see it in more industrialized countries where even sophisticated infrastructure cannot completely prevent extraordinary destruction. Think about New York last week, Santa Rosa two years ago. Tomorrow could be worse. Today's children and teenagers will face catastrophic consequences unless we take responsibility now as fellow workers with God to sustain our world. We frequently hear from young people who understand that their futures are under threat. For their sake, we must choose to eat, travel, spend, invest, and live differently, thinking not only of immediate interest and gains, but also of future benefits. We repent of our generation's sins. We stand alongside our younger sisters and brothers throughout the world in committed prayer and dedicated action for a future which corresponds ever more to the promises of God. Over the course of the pandemic, we have learned how vulnerable we are. Our social systems frayed, and we found that we cannot, in fact, control everything. We must acknowledge that the ways we use money and organize our societies have not benefited everyone. We find ourselves weak and anxious, submersed in a series of crises, health, environmental, food, economic, and social, which are all deeply interconnected. These crises present us with a choice. We are in a unique position either to address them with short-sightedness and profiteering, or seize this as an opportunity for conversion and transformation. If we think of humanity as a family and work together towards a future based on the common good, we could find ourselves living in a very different world. Together, we can share a vision for life where everyone flourishes. Together, we can choose to act with love, justice, and mercy. Together, we can walk towards a fairer and fulfilling society with those who are more, most vulnerable at the center. But this involves making changes. Each of us individually must take responsibility for the ways we use our resources. 
This path requires an ever closer collaboration among all churches in their commitment to care for creation. Together as communities, churches, cities, nations, we must change root and discover new ways of working together to break down the traditional barriers between people to stop competing for resources and start collaborating. To those with more far reaching responsibilities, heading administrations, running companies, employing people or investing funds, we say choose people-centered profits. Make short-term sacrifices to safeguard all our futures. Become leaders in the transition to just and sustainable economies to whom much is given, much is required from Luke 12. This is the first time that the three of us feel compelled to address together the urgency of environmental sustainability, its impact on persistent poverty and the importance of global cooperation. Together on behalf of our communities, we appeal to the heart and mind of every Christian, every believer, every person of goodwill. We pray for our leaders who will gather in Glasgow to decide the future of our planet and its people. Again, we recall scripture, choose life that you and your children may live. Choosing life means making sacrifices and exercising self-restraint. All of us, whoever and wherever we are, can play a part in changing our collective response to the unprecedented threat of climate change and environmental degradation. Caring for God's creation is a spiritual commission requiring a response of commitment. This is a crucial moment. Our children's future and the future of our common home depend on it. Signed Bartholomew, Francis, and Justin. Them some marching orders for all of us. May it be so.